The podcast ain't nuts. This is the Politics Jam podcast, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> A plague on both your houses, ladies and gentlemen. Ava Santina, Capital J journalist, the best of us. Uh, good morning. And the worst of us. How are you? Thank, thanks for having me. Um, Great to have you here. I'm in a foul mood. Are you? Yeah. What for? Well. Is it because I'm back? This time last Monday, Ollie, I had four Argus, Brighton Argus newspaper pens. This morning I had one. I lent it to a producer this morning and she didn't give it back to me. Deary me. So that is somewhere around the London Bridge area. <laughs> Wanted. One Argus, as in... Sorry, the local newspaper of the Brighton area, right? The it's Argus. the best newspaper in the world, some might argue. You've graced the front page of the Argus, have you not? I did, C accidentally. The demolition of a hotel or no, something? No, I, I actually, <laughs> that was, the hotel burnt down. Mm. And then I just innocently explained to one of the journalists that actually it was full of rats and I don't think anyone should have been staying in there in the first place, having worked the front desk Knowing it. for many years. Knowing it well. Yes, and explained to her that there was actually a period of time where sewage would back up through the sinks and people would come to the front desk and say, there is shit in my sink, mm. please can you move my room? And I'd go, I'm so sorry, but head office actually tells me it's not policy to do that, so <laughs> you're going to have to say that. <laughs> Normally as well, there's because that's different to when there's shit in the sink, but you've shat in the sink. That's very different when to when the shit is in the sink, but you don't want it to be in the sink. Yeah. Uh, that's an important distinction. Quite you right. You must have some stories working on a hotel reception desk. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's already one, clearly. That's that's a pretty mental story. But yeah. But then famous? My, my fa that's so glad you asked me that, because my favorite ever story mm. was this guy comes in and I'm like, oh, sorry, excuse me. And what I'm trying to say to him is that he's left a bag, but he, honest to God, turned around to me and goes, oh, Sorry, did you did you recognize me? And I was like, maybe. And he's like, from four in a bed. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, like, well, yes, actually, I did. One yeah, of my favorites. You got me. Um, uh, maybe, maybe the Argus could probably send us some pens, no? I'd really like some more pens. Nice, okay. An impassioned, an impassioned plea for more stationery. I really, really loved those pens. They wrote beautifully. Mm. And also it reminded me of um, the pursuit of journalism. Yes, of course. Which the Argus so... Um, Neatly encapsulates. Yes. Of course, of course. Yeah, big love. Big love to our, our local journalist colleagues. Yeah. Oh, I touched the microphone. Sorry about that, guys. Um, there's only one story in town at the moment, Ava Santina. Yeah. The Conservative Party Conference. Yeah. Conservative Party conference coming in hot. And that's obviously where our dearly departed Ed Campbell is right now, doing what he does best, mm -hmm. terrorizing those people. Mm. With a pack of XL bullies. <laughs> he's set them set them loose on the conference hall. He'd love to do that. Biggest budget he's ever gone anywhere with. <laughs> <laughs> For five XL bullies. Did he say how much they cost? Well, I don't know, but the, imagine the insurance or the liability on uh, taking five XL bullies to co a Conservative Party conference. No insurers touching that with a six-foot-long <laughs> shitty stick. Yeah, the woke ones aren't. Yeah, exactly. Fucking woke insurers. Did you see that The Sun called HS2 woke last week? Really? Yeah. What, the, the, sun the, the says, sentient train? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Sun says Rishi Sunak should cancel woke HS2. Um, That's fantastic. There are the signs that the word has lost all all meaning, I think. Because, you know, the, the, the lefty liberal Islington elite can often be found... Um, Noncing over trains. Yeah, exactly. I don't know whether, maybe it's because environmental protesters. No, because environmental protesters oppose HS2. Mm -hmm. So the train itself, if the protesters are woke, the train can't also be woke. No, 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 no. We like the train. Yeah. The, sorry, not we, but the environmental protesters like the train itself. They don't like the tracks. They don't mm -hmm. like where the tracks go. Yeah, ripped up a lot of ancient woodland. <sighs> Did it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> But yeah. I was watching Brooklyn the other night. Right. <laughs> There's a scene in it where they go to Long Island yeah. and the, the Italian boy that Saoirse Ronan is going to marry in it is like, we're going to build houses there. And Long Island is like um, Greenland, right? It's got like nothing on it at all. Swamp in it. It's, yeah, but it's like, if that hadn't been now mm. in an English hamlet, someone would be calling that a protectorate of the <laughs> green belt. You know? Yeah, look, I'm I'm personally I'm 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 big into HS2, don't mm. get me wrong. I'm big into HS2. And I think I I it speaks to 
I think the sort of horrendous declinist mindset in this country that, for example, we will not actually get it into central London and we won't build the 500 metres that will connect our two bits of high speed rail mm. um, in this country. And, and all of those things and the way that I think it's in, in six years, in a, um, this is off the dome, so forgive me if I'm wrong. I think it's 1863 to 1869. In six years, they built the Transcontinental Railroad, right, in the States. Now, obviously, that's slightly different to a high-speed rail line, but nonetheless, it is a feat of engineering. We started building HS2 in 2017, six years ago. I, the difference, the, like the way, the way people used to just do things, and in this country, we don't. Since 1992 in Spain, they've built about 2,500 miles of high-speed rail line, right? We, have, we, don't even, we don't even have fucking 250. I'm going to count to you. Yeah, go on. The High Line in New York. Yeah. 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 Famously mm. and absolutely, well, it, 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 was, it was built. It took like a decade to get this through. And then um, it became defunct in under a year, mm. right? Because it was totally useless. But it, it, because it took so long to build it in the first place. I would argue we're giving the people too much of a voice. So now if you look over to China, yeah. China have actually <laughs> opened up a new high-speed rail today. Wow. Yep. It was uh, commissioned eight years ago. It, work started later that year. They've opened it up today. Boom. Done. Right? Yep. It's because they don't ask the people. <laughs> they just say, this is happening. <laughs> it's in the five-year plan, yep. whether you like it or not. If your house is currently on the route we've specified, yes. you might want to move. <laughs> yeah, there's some great um, pictures of like, There'll often be sort of an elderly Chinese man who refuses to capitulate mm -hmm. to, to the, the, the Communist Party. And there are off, you can find these photos on Google where it'll be like him stood outside his house in a sea of like diggers and they've smashed everything all mm -hmm. around it. And then he's just sort of stood there with like a cup of tea being like, I will not surrender. And then eventually, obviously, he gets like a black bag put over his head and sent to the Gulag and you never see him again. Yeah. But yeah, respect to those guys. Um, you know who else is good at it? France. Really? Again. Because Pourquoi they are like, we're just doing it. We're doing it whether mm. you like it or not. Yeah, look, I think that there's part that, obviously there has to be room for public consultation. There has, there has to, we live in a democracy. This is democracy manifest, I don't know if you knew that. But, mm. um, like A succulent high-speed railway. <laughs> exactly, and it is succulent. It is succulent. But you can't, the reason it's so expensive, that large parts of it, we're building overground tunnels, right? It's cut these concrete archways so that people don't have to look at it or see it from their home in the Cotswolds. Well, well, or then we're also building it. Sorry, I never get to use any of this information. So let's this is so exciting it. I, for I me. I love that the, I should tell listeners and viewers, that it's not on the rundown. We've just, Ed's not here. <laughs> so we're going full send into train chat. We are. It's a, little um, treat, it's a treat for you. It's a treat for you. It, it's quite nice, you know. Um, it's also because it's like the first climate change proof rail railway. So it's got... Love resistant. Yes. So it's got... Like the tracks are in like concrete mm. bunkers. So it's not like the normal bolsters and that kind of thing, you know, which, mm -hmm. which expand in heat and contract mm -hmm. when it's cold, which means that the railway becomes defunct if it moves five degrees outside of its normal, mm -hmm. uh, you know. So if it's not 17 degrees and raining, the rails don't work. <laughs> I'm a big fan of that, to be honest with you. I think um, one, of the, one of the key ways that climate change is going to change Britain, right, is... We're, we're quite lucky in that we're not in the Sahel, we're not in sub-Saharan Africa, where sort of drought and famine is going to become increasingly pronounced extreme weather events, one of the resulting consequences of which will be probably up close to or maybe even more than of a billion refugee, climate refugees over the next 50 to 100 years. Um, Britain will feel the consequences of that, obviously, because there'll be more people who want to come to Britain. In terms of the people that live here already, um, climate change, generally speaking, is not going to be as dramatic here as it will be in somewhere like Bangladesh or uh, sub-Saharan Africa where either because of rising sea levels or increased extreme weather, you're really going to have some problems. Here, our growing season will be extended. The downside is we will have um, much more frequent and much more severe flooding. And for me, one of the big gaps in people often say, oh, you know, there is a climate crisis. We accept there is a climate crisis. Okay, so what are you going to do about it? Are you building flood resistant infrastructure? In the case of HS2, yes, we are. Mm. Um, but in terms of, I don't know, other A-road developments or other bits and pieces that we're doing all over the country, flood, resist flood resistance has to be absolutely number one to those things. 
um, has to be a, a super, super key priority. Well, London being one of them. Do you remember when there was yeah. a bit more rain last year and then all the tubes flooded? And so, Ava Santina, do you know one of the best bits of news of the last week in relation to this? I think I do, but I'm going to let you tell it. A wild beaver was born for the first time in 400 years in London last week. That, that is not what I was expecting. <laughs> the beaver is, the, I mean, they're amazing animals, right? But first of all, okay. Did you know that the beaver has its own conception of time? I'm really sorry, but I hope you get accidentally partridged for this. 100%. I'm, I don't care. I don't care. I'm, the natural world is one of my favorite things to talk the about. The beaver? Did you know that the beaver has its own conception of time? Really? Yeah. Because in their lodges and underwater, it's obviously quite low levels of light. Mm. Um, so they don't really have much of a set. Their circadian rhythm is different to ours. So a beaver's day lasts anywhere between 26 and 29 hours. Really? Their days are longer than ours. Really? Yes. And then it sleeps or it doesn't? They do sleep. Um, they sleep in their lodges. They sort of, they build these dome-like structures, right? Um, often multiple entrances underwater. Um, they have ventilation. They'll put a little hole in the roof so they get airflow. And they'll also then kind of put wood shavings down to absorb both the moisture from the water, but also to give them somewhere comfortable to sleep. Right. Um, and they'll sleep in there, yeah. They're they primarily nocturnal. They shave these wood shavings themselves? They do, yeah. Because they love not only to build dams and lodges out of wood, they also eat wood. What would be interesting is if you provided wood shavings to them, how long before evolution would stop giving them the big teeth? Yeah, big orange teeth as well. The teeth Re are actually oh, really? orange. Yeah. Um, I can keep going. Hold their breath for up to 15 minutes. They have a third eyelid that's transparent to protect their eyes when they're swimming underwater. Right. Anyway, that's amazing. Most importantly, out of all of this, <laughs> second, <laughs> the, the North American beaver, second largest rodent in the world. Yeah, awful how you categorise them as rodents, isn't it? Well, they it? are. You it's know. a technical classification. Yeah, but you know, is that subjective? No. Is one man's rodent <laughs> the other man's veal? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? So, do you know what the largest rodent is? I um. Oh, interesting. A moose. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, the capybara. You know those That's giant, giant guinea pigs. Yeah. That's a rodent, yeah, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. Down, down in South America. Yeah. Um, what was I saying? Anyway, so the beavers, <laughs> the beavers, and actually, this is this is why beavers are so impressive as animals because they're one of the only other animals in the entire animal kingdom that can create new habitat. So, in the same way that a human can build, or probably not on their own, but we as a species build cities and we change the environment, beavers are the same. So by building their dams, they change, they can, they can turn a grassland into a wetland. They can create these slow moving ponds, which other animals, for example, freshwater fish. Shit, really? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of, the, one of the best, and previously the reason why we had less severe flooding in Britain is because we used to have hundreds of beavers that changed the waterways to create these wetlands so that when there, was, when there were storm surges, when there was increased water capacity on the waterway, instead of it becoming a heaving torrent pouring down in a straight line all the way down to, I don't know, to pick your town, Bath, I don't know, fucking wherever, Bristol. The, the, the waterway is much more convoluted there, and there are these dams that create slow-moving ponds that can absorb water at a higher rate so that when there's a surge, you don't get this ginormous flood. It sort of, um, it mitigates the impact of it. Now, we killed all the beavers for their fur, and also, actually, they, they have some kind of chemical secretion in them that actually we put in perfume, which doesn't sound particularly nice to me, but nonetheless, right. we did. Um, and, and now, for the first time in 400 years, we have a wild baby beaver born in Enfield, Ealing. Um, and, yeah, if he's we... He's got a hell of a job ahead of him, hasn't he? He does, yeah. He's got a lot of work. Jeez. He's got a lot of work cut out. Uh, we say he. We don't actually know the sex of it yet. They haven't, they haven't um, caught it and, and found out whether it's a boy or a girl, but... Something you know, to look forward but, to. You know, the problem with that, you could give them too much agency, couldn't you? Or too much um, too much power because they would be able to direct. I swear to God, I think the age of man is over. Really? And the time of the beaver has just has just begun. That's a Lord of the Rings reference. Which, is it? Yeah, it is. Which is, without Ed here, is lost on you. But nonetheless. <laughs> um, yeah, no, look, you, you've got these like... That girl with the flower crown. Is that the one who said it? Exactly, yeah. The flower <laughs> <laughs> No, you've got these fucking like rudder tailed, third eyelided aqua animals that have a different conception of time and build dams. Do they have thumbs? They don't have thumbs. Well, really We've got go. that over them, but they are very dexterous. They often will eat. You know how a squirrel will often hold something in front of it and eat its face? They do that because obviously they're damming. You know, they're like. Yeah, surely if it can build a dam, it must be able to kind of. Yeah, but I don't think they have opposable thumbs. That move you just did reminded me a lot of my best friend's fiance who was pulling that move out all day Saturday. 
We went to an escape room. Oh, this? Yes. <laughs> because we went to an escape room. <laughs> <laughs> Try the doors. He was, that is exactly <laughs> how he was going through. I have never been to an escape room. I'd never been before either. So I assume in my head it's a room... There's wall, there's doors all over the walls, and you just sort of walk around testing them. And one of them opens. This had multiple rooms to it. Right. Cages. I they were like riddles. They are, yeah. Right. You had to okay. solve the riddle, you get to the next room. Yeah. And it was, um, it was, it was a saw maze, and saw. Oh, film. like the film. The film, yeah, yeah. It's like an official one. So. Was it like horror? Yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Jigsaw's in it a lot. Really. Like proper, like blood on the floor amazing oh my god and saw like famously was mine and my best friend's comfort film when we were growing up and we love it so much and really really enjoyed it i feel like you need to speak to someone about that <laughs> <laughs> i don't feel equipped <laughs> i don't feel equipped so, so when you say you were younger how old were you when saw was your comfort oh, film? starting out probably about eight i remember we, <laughs> 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 i do remember when like saw i think it was like saw five came out or right. one of them came out when we, it was an 18 and we were not 18 they're at number 10 now aren't they saw yeah, 10. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The, um we're going uh tomorrow night i think we're going but um we uh we tried to get into the cinema mm. and we like doled ourselves up like you've never even seen but like we ended up <laughs> another point for any predator man you can tell when a 12 year old <laughs> has just got a bit of lipstick on just saying <laughs> like um if you know if the guy at the odeon can yeah. tell <laughs> so um, he did he didn't let you in so we just bought a ticket for another film yeah and then and snuck then walk, in walk classic the, yeah That's yeah textbook that it's a good move yeah classic nice also the guy so stupid we yeah. were like all right cool then we'll we'll go to madagascar <laughs> <laughs> veering into the sore one um God, we've deviated there. We're massively. We? we should probably talk about the Conservative Party conference. We probably should talk about it. Yeah. Um, okay. Ed is at Tory Party conference, and we don't want to. We don't want to steal his dinner. He's going to have some absolutely fire, fire content coming out of there, as he always does when he interacts with the Conservative Party membership. Some good bits and pieces. So we, we probably won't spoil that too much. We'll, mm. I think with this conversation, we'll hit the sort of you know the the high minded um, national politics, the infighting, and etc. That 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 you is less readily available from um, from speaking to the membership. So I mean I'm 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 broadly going to hand over to you on this one Ava. It's your it's your field of expertise less less than mine. No, no I don't I don't think that you should do that at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately it's happening. No, um okay, so there's there's different factions aren't there mm. within the Conservative Party that are on maneuvers. I've seen first of all actually the, I know we said we're going to talk about Tory conference. This is no, this is Tory this is Tory party conference. You see Rishi Sunak being interviewed by Laura Kunzberg this weekend mm. when he was asked something that he admires about Keir Starmer. Mm -hmm. And he said, you, he said, what's the effect of basically, you can't sit on the fence. He was like, so pick a side, pick a side, which I thought was quite a, a crass and brazen way of answering that question. I don't know. When you say, oh, tell me something you like about Ava. Oh, she can't make her mind up. Like, what, what does it mean? Do you know what I mean? You're just being rude. But then I also didn't know whether to think. I respect it. But that could be quite endearing if your partner said it about you. So maybe there's a little <laughs> sparkle there. From, maybe. From Sunak. Maybe that's Starmer. what it is. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. I can oh, it's just such an, he's so indecisive. You know, we go to dinner, he doesn't know what he wants. <laughs> I order him everything on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> I paid for it all. Yeah. Um, okay. We let's wrote get, it off on tax. <laughs> let's get into it then. Yeah, let's get into it then. So there are obviously a, a innumerable, well, they're actually innumerable different factions, right? Well, I do. I mean, there, there are there are factions that the, um, the the body politic is talking about at large, but I actually think there are there are far more factions. Do you? Than, uh, yeah. Well, it, the whole thing is moving. It, it feels like conference season has come around too quick. Oh, sorry, I just really whacked the microphone. Sorry mm. about that. I think the conference season has come around too quick for for everyone to have settled and decided where they're going to sit. So there mm. kind of seems to be this whole split. There seems to be splinters that don't, you know. There's probably about 50, I would say, of different ones. But the, but the big ones, the big ones. Okay, so this is what... Last night, there was a dinner held up by the Conservative Democratic Organization, right? Oh, yeah. And at this dinner, Priti Patel was there and she gave a speech. This is the pro-Boris Johnson faction, right? Yes. Yeah. So Priti Patel had a lot to say about Suella Braverman. You know, doesn't like her. Thinks that, you know, she's just after the... To the fame and the money and the migrants and that was Pretty's job so obviously she's pretty upset about it she's like You're taking my gig here huh <laughs> but it's, I, I, I would really like to know like what the political argument is that, that isn't just the, na the naked and obvious you've got my job 
and I'm not happy about it. Mm -hmm. Because broadly speaking, both of them completely incapable of doing anything to reduce channel crossings. Um, neither of them uh, instilling any sort of rigor, discipline or professionalism in the Metropolitan Police. Mm. They are not, neither of them are serious Home Secretaries. Like, if, if Pretty goes, these are Suella's failings, you say, very good, Pretty. They're also yours. Mm. So it's it's interesting that she's going after her. Because, well, that's what's angered her. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah? It's angered her that she's doing as equally a bad job. She, she's like, Suella is just as bad as I was. Why on earth not keep me in? <laughs> exactly. exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, we know why, though, right? We know why Suella's in there, because Rishi had to. Uh, well, to have the attack dog, which I think he quite likes, the, the sort of the person who can say the more provocative, nasty, socially conservative things, but also obviously as well, because she is the sort of the darling of the conservative right. And he had to have, it's that thing, right? You either put them in your cabinet or they're going to be. But I'm not sure she is anymore. We'll Ooh, come to that. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself. Over to you. Over to you. So what was interesting about this dinner last mm. night was who was invited? Another, none other than Nigel Farage. Ooh. Now, what's Nigel Farage doing? And I love the soft G that I've added to that. Yeah. Farage. Farage. Uh, what is he doing at the Conservative Party conference and at a dinner? So that's why I'm now putting them into the bracket of the populists. Okay. Got you. So I think you've got Patel, Lee Anderson, Nigel Farage. Those are your populists. Your Boris Johnsonites. Yes. Yes. They're okay. going for the classic. They're still an oven ready deal. That's where they are. You know, <laughs> they're still quibbling about Brexit. Okay. They're not even anywhere near XL bullies yet. That's where they are. <laughs> They're way off the pace. 100%. All right. Now you've got the new conservatives, right? Okay. So I would say those are like your Nat Cons. Right. So you remember the Nat Cons, the of big course I American do, yeah. conference that was here last yeah, year? Yeah, yeah. So I think that's where your Miriam Cates, your Jake Berries, your Lee. Again, Lee Anderson. Lee Anderson's moving and shaking. He hasn't quite decided he where, he, where he's going He gets about Lee Anderson, yet. doesn't he? Fucking hell. He's, a, cause he's, in the, he's, he's part of the government as well. He's the deputy chair of the Conservative Party, right? Yes, but... Does that make him part of the government? I don't want no, to. No, actually, no. No, you're right. It's a Sorry. party job. No, very good. He's also part of the sort of the Conservative Party establishment by being the deputy leader of the, the deputy chairman, I should say, of the Conservative Party. He's getting around. Yes. Are you allowed to be in a faction and also be sort of, you know... Well, as you'll come to see, he's in so many of these factions that he's actually not in any at all. <laughs> it's actually quite difficult for him to say, Lee, you can't do that. Yeah. I, I, I like how he just does, he kind of does his own thing. Like, I sort of respect the, pr the previous like norms of being, you know, a high profile spokesperson of the governing party. One would generally be supportive of the program of government that, mm -hmm. that the party is adhering. And quite often times, it would just be like, you know, migrants should fuck off back to France. Yeah. But they're consistent. <laughs> yeah, fine. Consistently inconsistent, uh -huh, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Um, okay. I, who else? So tell me more about the, the new conservatives then, what's going on there. So this lot is kind of on a culture war, but not quite. So, so to explain this, I need to explain to you about the historic culture war girlies, okay? So that's the, the Kemi Badenox, all right? Your Suella Braverman, to an extent. Okay. Those are going down the old school trans people, we are making a problem out of them. Mm. Um, migrants, they're your traditional culture war fighters. Mm. The new conservatives, the NATCONs, right. they're on a whole different level. Okay. So while Kemi Badenoch might have a problem with people being trans, like Miriam Cates has got a problem with young boys watching trans porn because it's making them violent. <laughs> yeah, so so this, was, this was insane, right? She gives this speech. And uh, I, we have to say this, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever for the claim that she makes, which maybe I'm mis misinterpreting this. I don't think she was even saying that it was trans porn. I think she was just saying internet porn. Oh, did she? I think it was internet porn is making people trans. Right. Okay. I've got it the one way around. You got it. Sorry. So it makes complete sense now. Yeah. It makes okay. complete sense. I mean, I don't fucking... <laughs> Let's just go there, right? Porn has been around for a long time, Ava Santina. And I don't know if Miriam Cates can necessarily draw the conclusion that the increase, why does she think that more people are trans now as if like porn didn't exist, you know, 15 years ago? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I hate to tell you, it did. Yeah. It did. Well, then also she's kind of indicting a lot of her favorite journalists because, you know, we had tits on page three only, what, 10 years ago? 
We had underage tits on page three back in the day. I know back at the time. <laughs> That's when we were a country. <laughs> we used to be a country. <laughs> we used to be a country when the sun did countdowns to girls' 16th birthdays, right? Classic. Yeah, vintage, vintage sun. Um, I think that also happened on uh, Radio 1, didn't it? Oh. Yeah, I think it happened to Charlotte Church. It did. Mm. Was it Moyles? I think it was. Moving on. Anyway. Um... So basically you get to, I, I reckon they have one of those sort of random, you know, like a tombola type machine where they just sort of wheel it and they go, whoop, internet porn, trans. The porn's making the kids trans. Yeah. In the same way that Alex Jones goes, what, what, what's his thing? The, they're making the frogs gay. Really? He's, yeah, 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 yeah. He's like, oh, what is it? There's some chemical. Sean? Something like that. He's like, he's 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 basically said there's there's some incredibly um, niche but interesting scientific research about how changes of the water composition in certain rivers in America increases the um, the frequency at which certain frogs will will sort of um, What's the term? Is it herma- is it hermaphrodite where they they change sex? Right, you know how some species can change sex in order mm. to, for Intersex, example, sex is that? No, no, it's not. Oh, it's not. It's should. not. It's not that. We're making a bit of a hand fist of this. Anyway, basically, as a result of that, Alex Jones reads that and goes, "Oh, the frogs are turning gay," and it feels very similar to this Miriam Cates thing. Do you think that had anything to do with that old Trump advisor who once? allegedly crushed up an abortion pill and put it into his girlfriend's smoothie. I didn't even know that story. Yeah, it's mad. That is wild. It is wild. I remember reading like what she was suing him for. And I was like, that's pretty bad, that. <laughs> that is mental. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Insane. Anyway, Miriam Anyway. <laughs> So the factions of the Conservative Party of the culture war, right, which aren't aligned, I think you've got your historic culture war Huns. Yeah. Yeah, so that's your Kemi baden You've got your populists in the middle. Mm. That's like your Pretty Patel and now Nigel Farage. And then mm. you've got your new Natcons. Okay. And that's the Miriam Cates, Jake Berries. Do you think they've rebranded to new cons from Natcons because they didn't like, they didn't think it worked, that conference thing they did. They didn't, they didn't get quite the branding right. Or this is just the new. Yeah, Natcons, I think. Nazi, they really yeah. tried to go full American with that, and the British were like, "No, no, no, no." It's too. It's got too much God. We might hate the woke, but we also hate the Americans. Yeah, you yeah know? it's too Christian. Yeah, it doesn't really work here. We're too secular for that. Um, and then that you've got this big issue of tax that's bubbling away. Mm. So you've got your original low tax girlies. So you've got Liz Truss. She's doing a naturally a speech today, isn't she? She is. Can't wait to attract a lot At of a people. At a fringe, yeah. She is attending a fringe to, to explain to us why she was correct. Sorry. Liz Truss will be joined by Priti Patel for the Great British Growth Rally, where she will actively protest the policies of her successor. <laughs> do, do you think there's something quite upsetting that at one point Liz Truss had the power to move the markets? I know. And now we're not even sure if she can move a lot of people into a fringe event. I think that I think there'll be people at this fringe event mm. for sure. I would go. Yeah, I would go too. I, out of, I have absolutely no truck. I have no political sympathy for her whatsoever. Mm. I would not miss the opportunity to see Liz Truss live in the flesh. Like you know, you want to see Jimi Hendrix live in the flesh. You can't. You've denied. You've Sorry, denied that. Just, just to be clear, you are comparing Liz Truss to Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, because Liz Truss is the Jimi Hendrix of tanking economies and driving your country into the ground. You right. don't. You don't deny yourself the, the opportunity to get a, to get a little sight of that, do you? Okay. Like the markets cry chaos. Yeah, that? yeah. Like oh, yeah. Quite, I like that. Yeah. I used to live in a room full of mirrors. All mm. I could see was that. Yeah. That's very good. Mm. So I took. So I took quasi and I smashed the. Yeah, and that doesn't quite work. Do you know you can tell this is a. Uh, no planning went into this. Yeah, no, absolutely. You can um, tell. But the point so, is, being sorry, I want to carry on reading this, Ava. Um, she's going to call for a cu- uh, cut to corporation tax. This follows 30 trust sympathetic Tory MPs signing a, quote, highly unusual and borderline rebellious pledge. They will not vote for an autumn statement that raises taxes. Who are the 30 trust sympathetic MPs? Who are they? Well, um, yeah, that's a... Uh, well, that goes back to something we've spoken about 
at length on here before, but I will I will quickly summarize it, which is that a lot of conservatives, One Nation conservatives, did agree with what she was doing in principle, mm. but she did go too fast and they realized she wasn't the right leader and so they got rid of her. Had Rishi Sunak attempted the same and crashed the markets, they would have backed him for longer. Mm, yeah, They yeah, just no, wanted her out. You have said that before. I just, for me, <laughs> I think the ills, I wasn't um, complaining, but I just meant, as in pre listeners will know that we've covered this before, so that's why we're not going into detail on it. But if you, how can you be a Liz Truss sympathetic MP? And I know she's not the only one responsible for their current problems, but she is a large part of their current problem. There's the fact that the Conservative Party had the shortest prime minister in living memory, that there was almost a run on pension funds, largely down to her uncosted tax cuts. And as a result of which, Rishi Sunak is swimming upstream and will be swimming upstream for the next year. Boris Johnson obviously has a lot to play as well. But I think the Liz Truss moment, Johnson sort of slowly corroded and eroded the British public's feelings about the Conservative Party. You know, Because you've got to remember 2019, 80 seat majority, they're popular, right? And the party gate stuff, his... In what we understood at the time to be relative incompetence during the pandemic, which actually data these days is bearing out to be not the case that we sort of looked like we had a fairly middling um, economic performance when it came when it came to coronavirus recovery. But nonetheless, the vibe of the time was that he was doing a bad job. And I think Liz Truss was the sort of the nail in the coffin where everyone went, fuck this, I've had enough. Like, Do you think the that they've up. always been doing a bad job, all governments, but perhaps Boris Johnson was too entwined with the press he was too vocal with the press and kept leaking exactly what was going on all the time and so we found out too much about it because i guarantee <laughs> if you'd gone into the treasury mm. or um even number 10 in 2008 during the financial crash you would have gone what the hell is going on in yeah, here? Yeah, no, for sure. But we didn't know enough about it because everyone actually had some decorum and didn't report every single thing yeah. to the 24-hour news cycle. Look, all all political careers are in failure, right? You know, it is almost a certain, it's a certainty that the time comes. I think generally speaking, I think the electorate are quite tolerant. Mm. I think they're quite sympathetic. They, they will, they'll chalk up a lot to, it's a difficult job. Um, the... Uh, you know, un un highly unusual circumstances, whether that's <laughs> coronavirus, whether that's uh, Brexit, you know, in the same way that people actually tolerated Theresa May for quite a long time, even though it was only really when it became so intractable that people were like, fuck it, right? Yeah, election, let's go. Yeah, I mean, to be fair to her, though, you know, there are quite a lot of people who are quite upset about the Windrush thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. No, of course there are. Of course there are. And still upset that she's now being rehabilitated. Yeah, I saw she's going around being like, oh, I regret doing the go-home vans and stuff. <laughs> I'd love to get her on here, to be honest with you. I think she'd be a fascinating interview. Well, I do think there's something interesting about, like, the targets aspect of it. Mm. Like, how... There's something to be said about the human condition where you actually start going, yeah, I've got to meet my targets. And instead of that being, I've got to fill up 20 bottles, it's I've got to expel 20 people from living their normal lives in this country. Yeah. Like... But you, you know, where, we need to think, I need to think more about this before I start Okay. Start going off on one. But there's got to be something, at what point do you lose your hum humanity in government? That's interesting, actually. That's really interesting. And is it conscious? Yeah, quite possibly. Anyway, okay, let's, we can come back to that another time. But let's do, we've got low tax girlies. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is my, t so this is the faction. So you, yeah, 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 keep going. But no, this is the tax faction. Mm -hmm. So your low, original low tax girlies, Liz Truss, she's doing her little uh, fringe event. Mm. Then you've got Michael Gove yesterday coming out of nowhere to shout about how he'd like to see tax cuts as well, right? So he's now the, what, what do we call him? He's still leveling up secretary, no? Oh, no, he's tax cut. So he's tax cut girlies. Oh, sorry, I see. Low sorry, tax sorry, girlies. sorry, sorry. Tax cut girlies. That, this is an, there's an important distinction here between... Tax cut girlies yeah. and low tax girlies. Yes. Right? Okay. What is the distinction? Huge distinction. Go on. Well, one is Michael Gove and one is Liz Truss. <laughs> Let's start there. <laughs> They're very different people. But to understand that, you need to also know that there is a third part of this, which is the One Nation tax girlies. Right. Right? <laughs> yeah. So they are your actual proper old school, small C conservative lot, right? Your Bim Afalomis. Mm. Okay. Mm. Your, your Philip Dunn's. There's not many of them left now. Is There's there? actually a growing number. Really? There is a growing number of old school one nation lot. I you thought know, Boris you could even put Tom Tugendhat in here and Tobias Elwood. I think you could put Tobias Elwood in there. Would you not? 
I thought they all got culled. They got purged, didn't they? You know. But then the party. Uh, yeah, who was it that went? It was what? Stuart, Gork, Amber Rudd, uh, Grieve. Can I be clear that these people's politics are very different to David Gork's? Right. Okay, so what constitutes one nation now in the Conservative yeah. Party is different to what you previously it's would have It's further described. right than, yeah. than David Gork. So it, it, because, as the whole party has been pulled right by Rishi Sunak and his incredibly fiscally conservative and socially conservative attitudes, mm. that's meant that the left of the party, the one nation side of the party, is now more to the right than the one nation side of it used yeah. to be. Right, got you. Following. But the, but the important thing is they all want tax cuts. Of course. That is... That is the key part of being a conservative. What are we? Are, like, are, how can we be conservatives if we do like, not cut taxes? Yesterday, because I guess Michael Gove has kind of been exalted as some sort of um, great, great mind because of all of the chaos of the of the. No, but you know he does have quite a, a strong hand, right? No, he does. One hundred percent, he know, does. Um, and it, he, he's like the only one who's gone the whole way through, right? Yeah, and he always does feel like an adult in the room. Whether you know whether you like his policy or not, he does feel like he's adult, and he does feel like he knows what he's doing. No, he's clearly right? he's clearly an intelligent minister, and I also think, I think you could make a pretty strong argument that from of this conservative government, right, twenty ten to now, he is possibly the most impactful minister in terms of education reform, in terms of the levelling up agenda. I don't. I. I think. I think you could say he's the most effective government minister of the last thirteen years. I think you could say that. Anyway, so he's low tax. No. No, he's a he's a tax cut. Girl. Sorry, sorry, girly. sorry, sorry, sorry. He's, he's, a, he's a tax cut girly, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. How much can we understand people like him, people like Pretty Patel, people like Kemi Badenoch, and people like Suella? Is it a are we miss? Are we over intellectualizing what is actually just the remaining big beasts of the party on manoeuvres for the inevitable leadership battle that follows Rishi Sunak's election defeat? I don't think that Gove is anywhere near as into individualism the way the other three people you just said are. Right. Like, Kemi Badenoch has never been about party. She has always been about Kemi Badenoch, right? Mm. And I would argue that's the same with Suella Braverman. Because every every time she has been in a ministerial position, you know, she's been picked up, dropped, picked up, dropped. She's just decided to pick on a faction and go for it. And it's mm. often against the the, prime, the sitting prime minister of the day. She doesn't care at all. Mm. That's the proper individualism in her. But then Gove, when he's arguing for low tax cuts, tax cut girly, mm. I don't think he's doing that out of an individual. I think that's genuinely comes from a concern that people aren't going to vote conservative at the next election unless you give them some kind of bone to vote for. Yeah. Uh, you, I mean, they have to, right? I think it was, was it Ben Houchin, the Tees Valley mayor. He said um, we, that Sunak needed to do more to give people the excuse to vote conservative. Mm. Like their, 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 their agenda has been so devastating to the country that at this point they're literally being like, we need something. Like we we have to do some we have to be able to point to something when this election comes around. It's sick, it's cyclical, isn't it? It's electoral politics. You you're in government for long enough, and eventually people come round and they go, "You've had enough. The country's worse off than it was before. See you later." Well, on that, I thought you would enjoy this poll by YouGov this morning. Mm. Um, I do like a good poll. So, this polling out it's over out over the weekend. Eighty six percent of the public think the NHS is in a bad state. 69% say the police are in a bad state and 63% of the public say schools are in a bad state. So that's over a decade of the Conservatives in power. You're coming up to election, over 80% of people think the NHS is in a poor state. Mm. You can't blame that on anyone. Where are you going to blame that? Apart from if you're Kemi Badenoch or Suella Braverman. Trans people. I was going to go for the immigrants. But that, was, that was what I initially went for. But then when you said Kemi, I thought, no, what's more culture war? She, she you, you're so, you're right, you're right. It's, I tell you what, the NHS is blocked up with all of this fucking gender affirming surgery. Mm. That's what it is. Seven billion people on the waiting list. Mm. Seven million people on the waiting list, all because we're just trying to make people feel more comfortable in their bodies. It's wrong. It's yeah. wrong, Ava. It's disgusting. That would um, be the speech. Done. You know that tax, so part of the, the One Nation tax cut girlies. Yes, okay. They're, um, they're the future of the party, I think. 
I think that. Do you? Yeah, I do. I think that we're going to have. Leading up to the election, we're going to have this massive culture war argument. It's going to be ugly, bloody, disgusting, right? Mm. We're going to have a different person being subjected to, a different group being subjected to, you know, press torment for the next few months and debated. And then I think Keir Starmer will be elected. And I think you're going to have an opposition that is made up. The leader is going to be someone you don't really know, the wider public hasn't really heard of before. It's going to be a one nation guy and they're going to go back to small C conservatism and they're going to rebuild that party without any of the culture war hype. I see it differently, to be honest with you. Really? I do. I don't, I see, as the as you mentioned earlier, right, the conservatives have moved to the right. Keir Starmer has pulled Labour to the right and taken up all of that space. If you, th- if you think of the electorate as being on that sliding scale, which I, I know obviously they're not, it's a, it's a gross oversimplification, but... If you think as the Conservatives move more to the to the extreme, that leaves more and more people to the left of them. And so Keir Starmer can position himself on the left flank of the Conservative Party, which is far more to the right of where Labour has ever been, well, recently anyway, since Blair. And then all of those people behind him are left with no alternative but to vote for the Labour Party is the only credible vehicle for a left wing or progressive government. That's the position. And I don't think the Conservative Party, in response to that, tries to compete with with him in the centre. I think the Conservative Party pursues a more radically um, right-wing, rabid right-wing agenda in the same way that you could look at um, the popularity of um, AFD in Germany or um, Vox in Spain. I think you, we, have, we, have to th- we have to think about our politics in relation to th- those those political forces and political currents that are currently swirling around Europe, which, which is whereby basically young people and Israel actually, where, whereby young people are turning to a more hardcore right wing nationalist perspective. It's not happening here yet, and I don't think. I think if you're a conservative strategist, you you kind of you kind of look at the way that those movements are taking off in Europe, and you say. There's a and actually the conditions in in Britain are are right for it right huge disillusioned younger cohorts can't get on the housing ladder settled with student debt poor employment prospects and thereby comes the sort of the extreme right wing politics that becomes far more acceptable and um, believable when your economic conditions are poor that you blame the other. Yeah, you know, classic, classic fucking Hannah Arendt fascism, right? Who's the other? And it can be anyone. It could be trans people. There's not enough of them, probably. So you're talking migrants, etc. That's possibly where I see this going. And it's and if the and if the centre fails, that's where politics goes. I'm compelled to agree with you. But however, yeah, let's go. I would also, on a pure human nature mm. argument, right? Conservatives like to take what other people have. <laughs> Sorry, but you know, just you know. I thought that was a socialist. I thought that's what I thought. You that's what ne- we did. Yeah, but you never see a conservative. You know, if a conservative, a landlord, for example, mm. okay, he doesn't go to an open spot of land and just buy a new plot and build some houses. No, no, no. He's buying your house mm. and he buys the whole street and he doesn't care about it. If Keir Starmer is to take over right up to the to the centre right, yeah. The Conservatives, I think, in reaction to that, will go, no, we want it back and we want it to be bloody mm. and we want it. Yeah, My that's argument's true. nowhere near as good as yours. I'm no, just thinking is. on a pure revenge arc, <laughs> I think they'd want it back. I think, I think in terms of, in terms of um, whether it's a, a possible electoral strategy, yeah, they can compete on the centre and that would be the sensible thing to do. It's just whether or not that is what happens. I think grow increasingly. Um, we've said it before on this on the on the podcast loads of times that age is going to be the defining, the battle line, the fault line, right? And it just depends. the The Conservative Party reinvents itself time and time and time again. And if Keir Starmer becomes the Prime Minister of the status quo of orthodoxy, i.e., general declinism, broadly, broadly stable slash increasing house prices and um, the triple lock on pensions, the Conservative Party reinvents itself, becomes the party of disruption. I think if Keir Starmer doesn't 
doesn't have a good foot, doesn't address the structural issues in the British economy in his first term, I think I think it's quite possible that he he is a, he's a one term prime minister, and the the Starmer, yeah, because yeah. mm. he's cash he's one hundred percent he's cashing in on people's dislike of the Conservative Party right now. He will not have very long to come up with a program of government. Um, shock. The Tony Blair Institute has a great deal of policy research and policy proposals sitting and waiting. What, sh- what should we do about crime? How do you feel about a digital ID card here? Oh, I don't, I don't actually care what you think. Here's the, here's the research. Here's what we've concluded. Let's, let's roll them out. Whatever it is. I think he has very little time to come up with a, with a, with a program for government. And if people don't buy it, he will be out. And the Conservative Party can reinvent itself. As a um, as the disruptor, as the party of the youth, and sort of capitalise on that disillusion. I think that's I think that's a viable strategy for them. And all of this has to be caveated, right? We're talking about this is political predictions, which are broadly speaking. A but little who's Musk going game. to reinvent them? Who's going to do it? Because vote, you know, the typical person who would or strategist who would have reinvented them has already had their chance with Liz Trust, and it failed, right? Yeah. So the IEA had their moment. Their their experiment, right? And now. they failed. And I yeah. You think about Nick Timothy again, he's writing, you know, but, but you know, or Dominic Cummings, you know, all of these, you know, the people who really cared about the ide- ideological soul of the party, yeah. they are now completely unenthused by it. Mm. Yeah. It's not, it's not sexy to be a conservative right now. No. The brand is, the brand is diluted. Toxic. The, it's toxic. That's it. The brand is toxic. Completely toxic. But equally, I think people underestimate how... Um, how to- I'm just going to keep talking about Blair. Um, people underestimate how toxic Tony Blair is. And <laughs> yeah, typically. They- <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, people, people, regular people, normal people, mm. know Tony Blair to be toxic. The amount of times I have a conversation with anyone about politics, like literally anyone, it could be the barber, it could be a random man in the pub. Nine times out of ten, someone will say, he's a war criminal, we should be in the Hague. Mm-hmm. Nine times out of ten. I don't think there has been a more toxic politician since Thatcher than Tony Blair. Fine. If Blair cozies up to Keir Starmer, and I suspect the way that they are collaborating both the Tony Blair Institute and the Starmer Starmer Project, I think he underestimates the negative electoral consequences that happen as a result of that. And if Blair and Starmer, in the same way, trust me, the Telegraph, the Times, the Spectator, will love to hear in the same way that, you know, we progressives talk often about, you know, how Rupert Murdoch will go for dinner with um, the Prime Minister of the day. You will be getting daily updates about Keir Starmer and Tony Blair's rendezvous, conversations, etc. And the and the electorate will not like it. Will not like it. Mm. I'm, I, I love that we've just gone full send into like complete speculation, projection about the future. But that's my. That's my take. You know, sometimes it happens. You know, sometimes you won't speculate for a really long time and then there's a beaver born in Ealing. <laughs> and you get to speculate about the wetland. Yeah. Um, any more for any more? I'm all right. How about you? Yeah, I'm all right. Let me draw it there. Draw a line under it there. Oh my God, it's less than a week until the live podcast. Yeah, there is Mick that. Mick Lynch, Ben Smoke. There is that, Ava there? Santina, live and direct. In person, Liverpool. Where can, people, where can people get tickets, Ava? The world transformed. Wonderful. Buy a ticket. See you there. Live podcast. I think there'll be some audience interaction. There'll be some questions, right? We can. We will let them. We'll let them ask some questions, will we? Is that going to happen? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, Great. yeah. There is there is extra time allotted for questions. Wonderful stuff. Um, Mr. Lynch will be uh, will be there for a good hour. Mm-hmm. Ben and I will be staying around afterwards, sticking around. If yeah. you'd like to, if you'd like to chat. Beers? We'll probably have a couple of beers. Good. Very try and be you. normal, you know? Try to be normal. Yeah. You can only try. Um, and then I guess the only other thing to plug is the subreddit, right? Pole Joe subreddit. Oh my God, yeah. The subreddit. Um, the memes are fire in the Pole Joe subreddit. There's no other way to describe it. There's the flower girl meme. She's there. Um, there's there's a also a great thread about, which we don't give enough time for on the podcast, but it's Ollie Dugmore's small holding. <laughs> There is. I picked a courgette yesterday. Was it yellow? Yes. Was it meant to be yellow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a different strain. It's always they're all, all the fruit on that one are yellow. Yeah. I've never seen a yellow courgette before. Well, now you have. 
Is that a, is that a thing? Is it, is it, yeah, it's just like you know how you get you can get a yellow tomato, you can get a red tomato. You it's can not get, as common as that, surely. It's, it's, uh, you know how beans can be purple. No, <laughs> really. Let me, let me get take you to the garden over. What um, about a purple carrot? Have you ever thought about planting them? I have. Yeah, my carrots got massacred this year. Oh, by who? I didn't cover the them. Beavers. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was slugs. I've got a real slug problem. Um, I'm planning to build a sort of small two foot, like very small two foot by two foot pond. I want to attract frogs mm. to the garden because they fucking hammer slugs like no tomorrow. In an ideal world, you get ducks. That's just not feasible. Right. I, I don't know how I would even fucking start to get ducks in my flat in, in my house in South East London. Um, but... What about chickens? Have you ever thought about chickens? Chicken, see, the thing with ducks... Ducks love slugs to the point where they will ignore your veggies and go for the slugs. So generally speaking, what you want to do is you sort of put like a sheet of ply down in between a couple of veg beds overnight. The slugs all at the end of their night, savaging your vegetables, retreat under the ply. You would then walk your ducks from the duck house to wherever they're going to be for the day, through the veg patch to the board, flip the board. They hammer the slugs. And then you take them out and you, you wherever wherever they're going to be, to the pond, wherever, wherever they whatever they're doing that day. How do you lead them? You you, you like they, they know to follow you? There's yeah, some so kind of... particularly as well, once they know that they're gonna be they will just they will go to the sheet of plywood. He knows you, yeah, if they know you're the master of slugs, yeah, they, exactly. they'll follow you. The, the, the provider. Yeah. Um, the slug daddy. And they um no, obviously you just you open <laughs> you open the duck house, there's uh fencing, so there there's nowhere for them to go, right? So they just they would walk that way. You can you can herd them that way. Chickens, on the other hand, will fucking eat anything. And if you let them into your veg patch, you're going to you're going to lose you're going to lose crop. Right. You're going to lose your harvest. But can you, maybe you can get like a couple of like proper Burford brown chickens. Well, obviously that would be lovely, wouldn't it? Yeah. Again, not sure. Not sure. It's not viable right now. So anyway, I'm settling on frogs. I'm settling on. You create a very small pond, and that will attract frogs to your garden, and then they police the vegetable patch. Police. <laughs> and then carrots next year and then hopefully carrots next year yeah i've got a few but they're not like the tops of them i they're, they're i planted them too shallow um the tops of them are exposed i could have covered them but lessons learned it's constant it's a constant process what are you planting into kind of like like like, like Be a bed you've got a proper bed side beds yeah right but there's, there's like um the central part of my garden is paved over and i'm trying to sell to my wife that i want to lift the stones and turn it into a ginormous vegetable patch she's not keen um, but, you Not know. even after your great duck pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually chatting to a man um, last week who was trying to convince me that I should start beekeeping. Sorry, that I just, I'm just going to even save you that conversation <laughs> that you might want to have with her later. <laughs> I, I wouldn't even <laughs> take that one home with he said you. To, he said to me, he said to me, have you got a dog? I said, no, he's like, great, you can put a hive at the end of your garden. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, it's a very strong bee beekeeping community in um, in London. This guy he used to he used to do beekeeping at Buckingham Palace in Downing Street. Right. Yeah, he was chief 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 of the North London beekeepers. Right. Why did he come south? Did he embarrass himself in front? No, of No, no. I was I was. I um, imagine it's quite a tight knit community. I was with him outside of London. He has a small holding now. He he left <laughs> he had he left London. Yeah, he left London. Anyway, how long until you're subsistent? You've made the mistake of asking me about this at the end of the podcast, and I think I've been talking far too long. How long until I'm? How you mean? How long until I'm sustainable? How long I'm fully self sufficient? That's what you're asking. Yeah. No, no. I, I'm think I, I think I mean subsistent farming. Well, subsistent farming is like eating hand to mouth. Yeah, no, but I'm thinking of like the serfs. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> how how long I, until I'm until I'm a serf in a feudal system? Well, yeah, yeah. Ava, you wouldn't know this yet, but imminently published on the Politics Show YouTube channel is a discussion with Yanis Varoufakis mm. who will tell listeners of the podcast and other members of the Politics Show audience that we already live in a techno-feudal state and we are all serfs. Hot. I do you just, own the freehold? Yeah, I do, yeah. Well, then we'll have to go for Varoufakis' assessment then. I was going to say you're then just a, you're a slave to the... Uh, <laughs> To the freehold owner. Yeah, exactly. Um, right, so that's that was an extended plug for the subreddit based on the small holding memes. Um, <laughs> anything else? No. That's the end of the episode. Thanks very much, ladies Thank and gentlemen. See you on the next one.